Now, Ebola is a devastating disease for many reasons, but my work focused on two. Firstly, early Ebola, particularly in children, is terrifyingly nonspecific. Second, Ebola is nosocomial. These are doctors and nurses who died at Connaught Hospital in Freetown in the West African outbreak. Now, if your doctors and nurses are too scared to come to hospital, then your patients will be as well, with all the knock-on effects on mortality that that has from malaria, from sepsis, from broken legs and obstructed labours. So you have to develop a model of care that keeps your community and keeps your hospital safe whilst limiting that collateral damage. And that was really the crux of my work, looking at how we could safely manage and diagnose children with suspect Ebola whilst minimising that collateral damage. I'm going to describe the model of care we used, how it impacted on children, and how that grew into our cohort study. <laughs> the end of 2014 was the apex of the outbreak in Sierra Leone, and Freetown was bearing the brunt. At that point, our absolute priority was public health, how to get as many potentially infected people out of the community and safely tested without letting them trickle through into our hospitals. So we were using a holding unit model of care. So anyone who came to a hospital would get screened at the gate using a tick box list of symptoms. If they screened positive as suspect, they would then get admitted to a holding unit for testing with a PCR to see if they had Ebola or not. If they tested positive, they'd get transferred to a treatment centre, which tended to be the large purpose-built units run by NGOs such as Save the Children as MS or MSF. If they tested negative, they'd either go on for further care in the general wards or they'd go home. When we were very busy at the peak of the outbreak, there were bottlenecks at every stage of this. So people would often be waiting a couple of days even to get admitted for testing. The average turnaround time for the PCR was two and a half days but could often be substantially longer. And then people would often face transfer distances of up to 400 kilometres to the other side of the country to get to the nearest treatment centre bed. Now that of course means that the amount of time that these people are in contact with these people is really quite substantial, and we were concerned that the holding units themselves were acting as amplification sites for the virus. This is the screening flow chart. So it's a combination of contact and symptoms. Now for children, this case definition was modified, so you only needed, if you were a child under five, you would only need one symptom and a fever in order to be classed as a suspect patient. Now of course, this meant we were admitting almost every sick child who came along. These images sum up some of the challenges of working with children within a red zone. Now, PPE, or personal protective equipment, is actually really quite flimsy. So this image here, as a red zone worker, really gives me the heebie-jeebies because that hand being so close to your face could just reap up and knock your goggles and you've potentially been exposed. And you look like a monster. So again, I'm used to using my hands and my face to communicate with children, and you lose all that when you're working in a red zone. Moving on to treatment, this woman here is receiving some ORS. Now, standard of care in holding units was that everybody should receive antibiotics, anti-malarials, oral rehydration salts and symptomatic care. The reality was that the better staffed units would be able, were able to give aggressive intravenous and even intraosseous fluid resuscitation, whereas some were limited to oral medications alone. And trying to manage children who obviously had cerebral malaria and not Ebola using oral medications alone was one of the most heartbreaking things of the whole thing. And moving on to supervision. So because we were so worried about the potential risk to caregivers of being admitted to holding units, most units would admit children by themselves, even infants. Now, this little one here, he's not that sick. He is not going to stay in his bed space. He's already off somewhere. Now, in a holding unit where isolation is key, that is a real problem. So even with the ones this size, who you could put in the cot and would stay in the cot, of course, when it got to two in the morning, the poor little things would cry, and someone would pick them up and give them a cuddle, and bang, there is your cross-infection. So we were really worried that we were providing an inadequate level of care for these children, particularly for the ones who didn't have Ebola to begin with. So the two aims of our cohort study were, firstly, to try to interrogate that case definition, see if we couldn't come up with something a bit more rational. And secondly, to say what is the impact on mortality of being admitted to an Ebola holding unit if you don't have Ebola to begin with, and what is the potential risk of catching Ebola simply from being in a holding unit. And this was a multi-centre retrospective observational cohort, so 11 holding units, all of those within the Western area.
We tried to be as comprehensive as we could with our data collection, so anything we could lay our hands on, paper-based records, staff interviews, phone follow-ups to, uh, to relatives, and then triangulating that with child protection records, burial records, lab records, anything that we could fill in the blanks with what happened to these children. Some of the challenges. Now, working in a red zone, one of the key difficulties is information transfer. How you get data from inside the red zone, where you're giving your medications, taking your observations, to outside the red zone, where you keep your patient records. Now, there were many solutions to this, but none of them were ideal. They varied from shouting over the fence, to walkie-talkies, to um, uh, iPads in some cases, or this rather ingenious one here, which is a perspex sheet. So you would write something down on the inside of the red zone and put it up against the perspex sheet to be copied down on the outside. But of course you're going to have some information loss. Now, additionally, the more sophisticated methods tended to collapse within a couple of days because of the high concentration chlorine we were using. Even simple things such as clock batteries would only last a couple of days. So if you think you can't use a stethoscope because of infection prevention control and you don't have anything to count with, it's actually very difficult even to take an active heart rate. Which is why I'm very proud that we did manage to collect data on just over 1,000 children, so two-thirds negative and a third positive, and you can see how the distribution of that changed over time. Now, these survival to discharge figures, I think, really show what a devastating disease Ebola is, a 57% mortality rate in the positives versus a 9% in the negatives. But that 9% was actually good news, because Previously, an inpatient admission mortality rates at the children's hospital in similar months in previous years but were between 10 and 12 per cent, so actually not that dissimilar. And about a fifth of these children were unaccompanied. Looking more closely at the Ebola negative children, again, very reassuringly, we only found three out of 630 children who were discharged were subsequently readmitted with a positive test. Now, all of those children had already lost a parent to Ebola before they were admitted the first time, so it is much more likely they contracted it in the community. We were also able to contact nearly a quarter of caregivers who were admitted with their children. So these are caregivers of children who tested negative, asymptomatic caregivers who spent an average of two and a half days in a red zone. And of the ones that we could contact, none of them were readmitted with Ebola. Of course, we've got a substantial amount of missing data there, but most of that was to do with not having contact details for the parents to begin with, so whether it was an inaccurate phone number or no number at all. Looking more closely at the feature comparison, so you can start to see there are some things that might give you a stronger indicator of whether or not somebody has Ebola, particularly conjunctivitis here. Sadly, this malarial RDT, rapid diagnostic test positive, is a bit of a red herring because our numbers were really very small. Anyway, we performed, we split the data set into two and performed logistic regression on the training data set to develop a score we then tested on the validation data set and use that to generate this receiver operating characteristics curve. Now, what this is, is this is using different combinations of scores to give you different case definitions depending on what your context is. So, for example, say you're at the peak of the outbreak and you want to make sure you're using the most sensitive case definition you possibly can, you could use, oh, oh let's go back. Um, you could use this one up here, which is simply fever and fatigue to get into your holding unit, but then use one of the more specific case definitions down here which is contact, fever, fatigue, and conjunctivitis, to triage your patients and say, OK, this is much more likely to be Ebola. Let's fast track you to the Ebola treatment centres, so minimising the delays for your treatment whilst minimising the risk to the people that you leave behind. So in conclusion, I hope I've persuaded you that we can have a slightly more rational evidence base with how we are classing children as suspect Ebola or not, and that potentially the risk of nosocomial transmission is less frightening than we had initially feared. And also that potentially those holding units were not as dangerous as we had thought for those children who didn't have Ebola to begin with, and that the mortality rates were comparable to those at the children's hospital. That is, was the proviso that many of these children were isolated in a purpose-built unit that had a lot of space between the beds and had very clear instructions about hand hygiene and uh, if they had a caregiver for the caregiver to stay in the bed space. But the image I want to leave you with is this one. So this is the distribution of positives versus negatives over time. Now, this here 
is the normal rate of admission at the children's hospital. Now, all these children were still suffering from their pneumonias, from their gastroenteritis, from their malarias during these months here, even more because this is the rainy season and they weren't coming to hospital. And that is the unquantified collateral damage that Ebola caused. And if we're not going to let that kind of collateral damage happen in a subsequent outbreak, we still have a lot of work to do. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>